All right, so we've got 12.01 straight up. We're gonna go ahead and get going. So Tad, why don't you go ahead and take it away? Sure, um, thanks everybody for coming. I'm Tad Moore, I'm the president-elect um, of the 2021 Association, Northern Arizona Association of Realtors. Um, but a couple of years ago, I was involved in the MLS committee. Um, so this presentation is really to sort of inform agents um, on the process of greening the MLS and what all that means um, to you and how to actually implement it in your business. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Can you all see that? All right. Um, yes. So the, the, the process, we, we call it greening the MLS. Um, so a little bit of background on this, um, just from a, a macro sort of level, more and more buyers um, are, are really interested in green features. They're interested in green building, they're interested in energy savings. Um, this is a quick snapshot from the 2020 uh, profile of home buyers and sellers that NAR puts out. Um, quick caveat, if you don't know what that is, it's a absolutely fantastic um, research tool that NAR does every year about um, everything on home buying and selling trends from lending practices to what they're looking for in homes and um, just, just tons of data and it's free. So head to the, the main website and you can get that. But one of the cool things that they talked about was specifically about green features. Um, and this is the table based on their, the data they collected. So as you can see, lots and lots of people at an increasing rate um, care about environmentally friendly features when they're buying a home, when they're home shopping. So the top graphic there, if you can see 87 or 83% um, are, are interested or think it's important to have environmentally friendly um, features that impact heating and cooling costs. So even though you might not necessarily have a client that says, I want green features, they really do. They just don't necessarily know how to articulate that. So they say, what are the energy savings? Um, what's the utility bills? Uh, what are the windows? Are they double pane or single pane? Um, things like that. So it's, and it's a, it, this is a snapshot from last year, but it's a, a increasing demographic um, of your, um, your clients. So you, you need to be well versed in all of these sort of terminologies. Um, so having said that, people are looking to buy homes that have sustainable features, but there's difficulty in actually doing that. And there's a few reasons. So if I'm a, a consumer and I'm searching for a specific feature, um, it was difficult to find that. You know, you couldn't just click on how we do with other things where I want three bedrooms. You know, there was no place to actually find that data. And so you're combing through and trying to determine from photos or, or greater descriptions. And um, it's just hard to find. Um, the other thing is when you're actually trying to buy um, a home with sustainable features is there's initially sometimes there can be an added cost that, that goes into upgrading or building um, energy efficiently from the get-go. So there's a, a little bit of a, an increase in, in the, the cost when you're shopping for these as, as opposed to an old outdated um, energy bleeding home. Um, then I'll skip down to the, the fourth box there. In 2020, 87% of homes were purchased with financing, right? So um, everybody's applying for loans for the most part to get a home. So what we found happens is buyers want to, want to buy a green home. They have difficulty finding it, but then eventually they do find it, um, but it might be listed for sale or it might be an additional cost um, to construct it in the get-go. So when they go for the financing portion of it, the appraisers are having a really difficult time showing that justification because there isn't good data. There isn't good data to point to that says, um, you know, these two homes are similar, but this one sold for a premium because of X number of um, energy saving features. So as we all know, um, you know, with lending, if an appraisal doesn't come in, then it makes it really difficult to, to continue the loan. Either you have to come up um, with additional cash or, or whatnot. So it's just sort of this cycle that comes, keeps going around and around. So what do we do about that? Um, this was our first step is we called it greening the MLS. So basically all that is, is, is just adding additional fields within the MLS to help agents find specific things that are related to green building um, that their clients are searching for. Um, add them um, in for, as a listing agent when they're, they're marketing a home so that people can find them accurately. Um, and then closed listings, uh, 
what will happen eventually, this is sort of a, a slow building process, is as we start to update the MLS with these homes that sold, that sell, that have these specific features listed, then appraisers can use that data to start building sort of their, their data portfolio, if you will, of homes selling for a premium because buyers want or are willing to pay a higher price for these, these features. Um, then of course, if the appraisals can start coming in um, that accurately reflect that, then the lending becomes easier. You know, everybody wants to do it. It was just this, we didn't have the data to show it um, and to show investors and um, that, that are backing all of the, the mortgage securities and things like that, that it's a safe investment because there's, there's a justification for the extra, extra cost. Um, the process that we did, we, uh, it's kind of a big thing to tackle just within the MLS committee. So we actually formed an MLS, a green MLS task force that had a couple of members from the MLS committee, but also, um, just other agents that were, that were interested in the process. Um, we actually kicked off with a larger meeting that, that included other people related just throughout the community. So for instance, Nina was there because she's the guru on sustainable building practices here. Um, we had um, Green Builders, we had Ian um, from Green Mountain Builders and we had, um, shoot, I think Tom from LSS from Ezra was there because they're just they, something they do a lot. We had um, people that were familiar with appraisal, the appraisal process and lenders and all that. So we could just hash out what the problem was, what issues they were finding, what was common here um, to make sure that we sort of include all of the right data so that we can we can start to actually chip away at all of this. Um, then essentially we just took all of that information to determine what fields to implement. I will say it became super easy because we're not the first one in. There's there's plenty of MLSs throughout the country that have done this before. So it was um, became a matter of literally just stealing what we liked. We found what, what pieces were good from this one, what pieces were good from that one, what was um, um, made sense to use in Flagstaff. So it was just determining that. And then we, we determined what we would wanna actually add. Um, and then it just became sort of the logistics behind the scene of adding features to the MLS forms um, and then coordinating with Flex to implement them, which seems kind of easy, but Judy can attest to this too. It's a little more complicated than that because we have, um, there's a specific MLS language that we all have to abide by so that it, it um, syndicates out correctly. So if you put something in it makes sure it goes to the right fields on Zillow and realtor.com and um, all that stuff. So there was some back and forth and just behind the scenes stuff that, that had to happen. Um, and a huge thanks to all of the people that were on the task force and the MLS committee um, and Shelby and Judy and Ventrice too did a ton to just deal all with the, the implementation side of things. Um, and then the result of all of that was these amazing forms, wow. Um, so. You guys probably all noticed when we we changed it up and actually added a page and all of these little green leaves that you see when you're submitting the forms, those are all fields that we added that are specifically related to a sustainable feature to sort of draw your eye to it so you can you can get used to this is something that differentiates it from from another property. Um, the a question I get a lot is, you know, when we're filling out these forms. These are all new terms. You know, a lot of us aren't familiar with all of these that I'll back up a little bit that that show in um, like low VOC insulation or straw bale or rammed earth if you don't know. So the one caveat I will say is if you're in doubt about it, leave it out. Um, because the seller, if you're sitting down with a seller and you're going all over all of these forms and you ask them if it has like ICF form construction and they have no idea then there's a solid chance it does not have that. Um, but, you know, we're trying to sort of build this data bank of all of these green features. And the absolute worst thing that we can do is pollute it with bad data. So if we start just, I think it might have that clicking here. I think it might have that clicking there. Then it just, it just dirties all of the data that the appraisers are seeing as well, because they, they think that this house had these features, but sold for, you know, a significant amount less than this other home that really has them. Um, so that's that's what we don't want to do. So if you need to err on the side of caution, but that's the great part about this class is Nina um, and Marty have done a fantastic job in helping. They'll help you educate on or help to educate you on what to look for when you're filling out these forms. So you might familiarize yourself when you're sitting down at a listing. Um, 
there's actually a, a few pages at the back of the data form too that you guys might have noticed and you kind of wonder why they're there because nobody signs them. But these are just some quick cheat sheets. If you're um, sitting down with a seller and they have a question on what something is, what sustainable flooring means, you have a, a sort of a Cliff's Notes cheat sheet to, to mention it to them and see if it jogs them. Oh yeah, we had that done. And here's the a extra box of it that has the label so we can um, verify that it's the correct thing. Um, and we also have this, and I think it's really sparsely utilized because people don't really understand what it is. Um, but in the developing, in the development of the, the adding the green MLS fields, we found that many MLSs across the country have an additional disclosure. Um, think of it kind of like the green spuds. So um, you're, you're, you fill that out with your, your seller anyway, just to, to show the buyer everything that the seller knows about the property, that any material fact on the condition. So this is a chance for, if you're sitting down in a listing that has some of these features and they've invested that money in it, um, it's an additional layer for you to be really descriptive. The seller can, can tell you exactly what the R value is of the insulation, um, you know, just, just really go into more detail. So when you're presenting it, to, when a buyer is researching it, they can see it's more than just a checkbox. They can get a little more info right off the, the bat. Um, the other point of this was we, again, we don't want to dirty the data with uh, bad data. So if, if you do sit down at a listing and they, the seller is, you know, well-versed in green building and, and tells you all of these features that, that, um, the, the property has, and you want to add that in, this just adds another layer of, um, sort of legitimacy, you know, a seller has to sign off on this and they're held accountable to a certain extent. So, it's just that comfort level for a buyer too, that these features that it says it has, it actually does have them. Um, it's really underutilized. And again, I think it's just because folks don't really know it, what it is. Um, but if you do see one, I mean, and again, this form isn't for, the, the point of greening the MLS isn't when you're sitting down at a, at a listing and they say, oh yeah, we've just put in LED light bulbs in the front porch. Like that's not, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about significant, you know, upgrades to insulation or changing out the windows to be more energy efficient or a new construction where they had the opportunity to build and design it with paths of solar or, or whatnot. So it's those things that will really set a home um, apart from the others. Um, I wanna point out a couple of really amazing things that, that resources that we have that a lot of folks don't know about. So if you go to green.realtor, save that address. Um, it's the NAR sort of, website that's all about green building. So you can you can research um, local appraisers, who's registered for what, you can find all of these forms are actually here as well. So these forms that I have posted up here, if you if you are in the, you know, we, we keep going back to the real benefit that we get as practitioners in doing this is that we're um, in, improving the appraisal process. So the appraisers have this data. The other, the caveat to that is if you, if there's an appraiser that's not familiar with these type of buildings, then they might not know either. So if you are involved in a transaction where there's significant um, green features that, that justify an increase in price or desirability or whatever, um, you can specifically ask for an appraiser that's versed in these building practices. Um, and, and these are both available on the, the, real, the green realtor website, but they're a standardized form. You can put your own company logo on there too. It's a, it's a letter that you can send to the, the buyer's lender. If you're representing the seller, you can send it to the buyer's lender that says, um, here's the, the features that the, the home has that an appraiser needs to take into account. Um, it's kind of a, a more in-depth just um, data sheet again to give the appraiser even more ammunition so to speak, and data on how to justify the, the increase in desirability of the particular property. Um, a quick caveat to that though, I, I don't believe that there's anybody, um, and I think that's correct, Nina, you know, we don't have a local appraiser that's been like green certified through the, um, the appraisal institute or anything, but um, I can tell you, I know that there are ones up here that have completed coursework, just haven't finished all of this. So, you know, we held a, we actually sponsored a, a specific class for green certification for appraisers here where appraisers came from all over the country to take it. And I know Mark Gard was there. Um, and I know that Ben Perrin is pretty well versed. Um, that's not to say that that none of them are or the other ones aren't, but you know, at, at a minimum, I would have these discussions with their appraiser. 
say, are, do you know these things? And if not, then try to request another appraiser that, that might have a little bit more knowledge base in this these particular things. Um, but again, these are all available right at the Green Dot Realtor website. Um, so once we did all that, really the big thing is just this. It's educating people so they know how to use these forms correctly. Um, become more familiar with green building, what that means, what energy efficiency means, what sustainable features are. Um, and there's a few different things you can do. So NAR actually has a two day course for a specific green designation. You can do it online. Um, you can do it in person if, you know, as the world starts to normalize again someday. Um, but it's a fantastic one. It's sort of a top level, um, just basics on some of the terminology you might hear about in, in related to green building. Um, but it also provides a ton of resources to where to research more if you want to really start to, to build a knowledge base. Um, there's also an eco broker designation that you can have. Um, I did a bit of research. So I have the green um, realtor designation. I think it's great. I did some research on the eco broker designation with um, another agent down in the valley that's actually, ironically, her name is Jan Green, um, but she's sort of the statewide guru as far as green building and being a realtor. Um, and she said the eco broker designation is also good, but it's not sponsored by the Association of Realtors. It's not part of, like, it's not an official um, designation, so to speak. She also said she thinks that the green gets a little more updated more frequently. Um, but again, I'm more of the the more classes you can take, the better. But if you're choosing one over the other or, or prioritizing, I would probably suggest the green course first. Um, then we're going to be doing things just like this, where we're trying to do more outreach and, and educate from the association level with um, all of y'all to, to give you just build that knowledge base. Um, another great resource is to start to attend some of these Coconino County sustainability tours that Nina puts on now that we're getting back to normal. I, I was able to, I've been able to go on one and I learned more in that one day than I have in any other, just being able to see things firsthand and a seller point to this and point to that and why it looks like this. And this is why we did it. And this is why the house is oriented this way and all that. It, they're, they're fantastic. Um, and then the education from our end is just constant. It's, it's an ongoing thing. So as um, technologies in, improve or change or whatever, it's just a constant thing that we'll be doing. And that is all that I have for mine. Um, I'll turn it over to Nina now. Um, and Nina, just a quick introduction. Again, Nina and Marty both work with the uh, Coconino County Sustainability Department and they're fantastic and they're they're the go-tos for um, if you have a question about sustainable building here in Northern Arizona. Nina, it's all yours. Great, Ted, and thanks for that introduction. Um, yeah, we definitely are a resource for you about anything related to sustainable building. So feel free to reach out. I've got my contact information at the end of my presentation. So um, we'd be happy to discuss any of this with you later. So I am going to share my screen now, and I want to thank Marty for putting together this presentation. And so can everybody see that? Yes, great, thank you. All right, so thank you, uh, Tad and the you know, uh, Northern Arizona Association of Realtors for inviting us here today to talk to you about this. Uh oh, my a little slow. So my computer's a little slow. So please bear with me. Um, we wanted to thank NAR for also putting together the green MLS. Uh, we had been hearing for years from contractors that they were putting extra money and attention into building more sustainably. But then when they would go to sell the house, that wasn't reflected in the valuation of the building. And so I did a lot of research on, you know, obstacles to that. And one of the things was to, you know, if it's not, doesn't show up in the MLS, then, you know, that all those features are just not seen in the industry. And so it was a really important step to get this green MLS. And uh, we're really grateful that uh, NAR put all that effort into making it happen. 
And so just a little bit about the Coconino County Sustainable Building Program. Uh, our whole purpose is to just make more sustainable building happen in the county and all the cities within the county. And the real cornerstone of our program is project certification. So we, uh, it's just like LEED certification, except it's a local free program where if people want to incorporate more sustainability into their projects, they have a resource uh, for that. So we do education throughout the process, but then we also verify what people do, uh, what sustainable features they implement. And then based on how many of those they do and our checklists, they'll be certified at a particular level. And then we have an award ceremony every year and we make these plaques to give to people and they're supposed to stay with the home. So if you ever see one in a home, then you'll know that it was certified by our program. But an important part is that these projects then become tools for teaching. And so like Tad said, we can ask people who have been through the program, do you wanna be on the tour this year? And so different projects are on different years, different people are in town and want to showcase their houses. And so uh, it's a great way to educate the community to have real live projects like that. So today we're going to be uh, doing these two things. We're, I'm going to give a general overview of green building and high performance homes. And then we're going to dive in to all the different boxes that are on the input form. So uh, it is going to be a lot of minutia and it's going to be a lot of pictures because I thought so that that would be the easiest way to sort of showcase these features. Uh, is to use the projects we have and, you know, show what it looks like in real life. So in the form, all the little uh, green leaves designate the sustainable features, and we'll be going through those. All right, so first, just an overview. What is green building? A lot of times people really think of energy efficiency when they think of a green building, but it's is more involved than that. And there are a lot of aspects of green building and I'll be going into them a little bit more. But this is a quote that just sort of shows you that it is more complicated than that. So it is about using fewer resources and having less impact on the environment. And some of those things are right energy efficiency, but also stormwater management, disaster resistance, indoor air quality and things like that. So when I first started working in the sustainable building program, I actually live in a straw bale house. And I thought sustainable building was all about natural building. But since I've been in the program, I've learned a lot more about these high performance homes or uh, homes that use building science to be more uh, sustainable. And so I wanted to highlight this difference because we have a whole lot of uh, houses that have gone through our program. We have over 250 projects we've certified now, and they come in all shapes and sizes. And so I wanted to show you some of the diversity here uh, when we talk about green building. And so the upper left house is a great example of a high performance home. So it's a traditional stick built house. And you know, it looks like a pretty normal house, right? Uh, but a whole lot of effort uh, went into the design and the construction of the house. And so it is built to have a really tight uh, envelope. It's a really airtight, uh, you know, home and then very good insulation. And then also uh, high efficiency mechanical systems like the heater and the hot water heater. And then also a lot of attention to indoor air quality. So very low VOC or zero VOC um, paints and things. And then also, this is actually one of Tom Elsis's of Ezra Builders. And he puts a heat recovery ventilator in every single home he does because he really believes that indoor air quality is of great concern. So that's a great example of a high performance home versus the uh, house on the right here, which is a straw bale home. So it's taking much more of the natural building approach. And so straw bale is actually a waste product. 
and you know it's often burnt in the fields and so giving off you know carbon dioxide whereas you know if you put it into a home it's super insulative but also it doesn't have as much embodied energy and material uh, in the construction as a stick built house would and so it also is passive solar you can see all the glass that's on the south side of the building and so it, it's capitalizing on the energy uh, from the sun to heat the building. And then it has wind turbine and uh, solar panels too, but it's much more geared uh, towards building naturally. And then finally, this project in the bottom is sort of a combination of both those things. It actually is owned by, um, he teaches building science at NAU. He actually created a building science program. And so it's super high tech. It's got a online dashboard where you can uh, you know, see all the water use and energy use over time, but it also incorporates passive solar, as you can see the doors open there. Um, and so, yeah, there's lots of different ways people decide to do it, and a lot of it has to do with personal preference, um, but all geared towards, you know, saving resources and less impact on the environment. So why do green building? This gives you a little bit of information on the impact of buildings on the environment. And so there are four different uh, impacts shown here, global energy use, global greenhouse uh, gas emissions that contribute to climate change, global water use, and then solid waste streams. So you can see for three of those, buildings make up almost 40% of the impacts. And so the purple bar is actually, if you implement some of these green building practices, what we can reduce that impact to. So you really can make a big difference by building in a more green manner. These are the six elements of sustainable or green building um, from our checklist. Different checklists are slightly different in terms of what they include in, in terms of features and uh, elements, but these are our six. And so site and community, we're really interested in seeing if a project has reduced the impact on the site by like protecting trees and um, things like that. And then community connectivity is about how connected you are to the things you need. So are you able to bike and bus and walk to the store and the school or, or do you have to drive a ways? And so we give points based on those two things. Material and resource use. We like to see local renewable and reclaimed materials and as well as waste reduction. Um, and that is because it has less impact on the environment, but also most of those things uh, have less embodied energy, it takes less energy to make reclaim, I mean, re renewable, I'm sorry, recycled materials take less energy to make than uh, those from virgin materials. Um, energy efficiency and use, um, you'll see, you know, we'll be diving into all the different ways that people achieve more energy efficiency. Um, and then, you know, adding solar PV or solar thermal will definitely reduce the amount of energy you need. I already talked a bit about environmental quality, you know, really important to the health of people in the home to have proper ventilation and then to prevent some of the uh, volatile gases from, you know, getting into your home. And so we'll talk more about those as well. Water efficiency is really important in our community. You know, we've been going through uh, a few drought years and the city has implemented measures to keep people from, you know, using as much water uh, just with irrigation and things like that. So, but it's actually even more important for people in the county that haul water, you know, and are paying people to deliver water or, you know, bringing it in by truck to reduce their water usage. And we'll talk about ways to do that. And then finally, um, our program, we have this aesthetics, innovation, and education section because um, these are important community values. And those community values do contribute to sustainability as well. 
If anybody has any questions at any point, uh, feel free to raise your hand and I'll try to keep an eye on that. All right, so this slide is about the benefits of green building. And, you know, I showed what the impacts of building are on the environment. And some people might be motivated by that, right? They just want to be green and they want to protect the environment. But a lot of people aren't motivated by that. And they are more motivated by some of these benefits that are shown there. In particular, the lower operating costs are huge. And so we'll be talking about the HERS uh, rating later. And that's a real tangible number of showing how much energy you can save um, by you know, making a more energy efficient building. But also with water, you know, it, water does cost money. And particularly if you're hauling it, it can make an impact on your budget to um, reduce your water usage. So we'll talk more about these. Uh, the less maintenance, a lot of times, you know, and with our checklist too, we do give points for durability. So durable materials, but also designing and constructing in such a way that a building is more durable. Uh, one more thing about this, the higher levels of comfort. And so, um, Tom Elsis of Ezra Builder is, is really geared towards this and, you know, works on a really tight envelope, partially because, uh, you know, then you're not getting fluctuations in the air temperature, you know, draftiness, but also for insects, he really, um, you know, strives to make it as airtight as possible, so that you also don't get ants coming in your house, like, like, unfortunately, I do with my straw bell house. <laughs> uh, all right. Okay, so now we're ready to dive into the green fields themselves. Are there any questions so far? All right. So this is, so what we're going to, as we go through this, um, basically we've got these little sections uh, that we've got screenshots of, of the form. And so um, Marty's checked off which aspects are on the slide so you can follow along just like uh, is in the form and we'll go through it uh, as the form uh, rolls out. So we've got the green disclosure that Tad was talking about. And I thought that was really helpful what you said, Tad, about the purpose of the form being like, you know, checking boxes is one thing, but here you have an opportunity to really showcase green features with uh, more information. And so, you know, if it is just a check box, people might not uh, take it that seriously, but if you actually have some data to back it up and some more description, uh, it's more likely to be noticed. All right, the next section is the kitchen features. And there are just two green leaves on this section. And that's uh, Energy Star Qualified Refrigerator and Dishwasher. And so Energy Star um, is a governmental program. They do certification of all kinds of things for energy efficiency. And they have different standards and different criteria for all the different categories. So if you're buying a furnace, uh, you can go to the energystar.gov website and you can look at all the furnaces. You, you can actually they have a product finder. And so you can do it by brand. There's a lot of ways to sort the data, but I encourage you to spend a little time there because it'll be helpful um, in you sort of trying to sleuth uh, which uh, appliances in homes are Energy Star rated. But for some of them, um, it does have like a specification. So in order to be Energy Star, furnaces have to be, uh, I think it's 90% ef efficient. And so they have all that criteria on the website as well. But only certain of the kitchen appliances are can go through the Energy Star process. And so the refrigerator and the dishwasher are the two um, that are two main built-in appliances that are um, part of that. So I've got a couple pictures here to show you kind of how to sleuth for whether it uh, appliance is Energy Star or not. 
this dishwasher that's on the right has this little Energy Star logo. You usually can find it by opening the dishwasher and looking on the uh, top of the door. If it's not there, you can again go to energystar.gov and put in the, the model number and see if it is an Energy Star model. And then same with refrigerators. Refrigerators, you don't typically see the Energy Star logo on, so you have to do a little more hunting in order to see. But if it's a new home, your the best way to find out is with the energy guide. And those actually have Energy Star logos on them. And so this one, I did include the criteria for uh, closed dryers and closed washers. And so you can see they do use less energy than standard models. But for washers, it's even more important because it, they also have a criteria for water usage. So Energy Star closed washers use both less energy and also less water. Oh, and yeah, those both had the Energy Star logo on the front of the appliance. All right, so for floor coverings, there were just these two uh, potential green features, the green label plus certified carpet. So that's a specific certification and it's related to indoor air quality. So it is about how much off gassing of uh, volatile organic carbon, BOC, um, that that product has. So if it's certified, it's going to be a lower VOC carpet. So that's a, a clear label to look for. You know, like Tad said, if it's an older home, you're not going to have access to finding out whether that was certified unless the homeowner has, you know, some information about that. And then the sustainable, uh, just plain sustainable here, to me, the way I interpret that would be it either of two things. So when we look at flooring in the sustainable building program, we're looking at both whether the materials in that flooring are more sustainable, like do they have reclaimed content? Are they um, sustainably harvested like this cork, uh, cork floored house over here? And so, you know, we'd be looking for like some sustainable certification of the materials or uh, again, that air indoor air quality piece. Does it have some kind of uh, green certification related to lower VOCs? All right, for heating, there are the three green possibilities here. So a programmable thermostat, really simple, you know, simple and easy, but saves you a lot of uh, energy and money because then you can set it to heat when you're there and you need it and uh, have a lower temperature when you don't need it. So that is a green feature. And then Energy Star uh, equipment so like these, the, these are boilers for a hydronic uh, system. And so you can see the little blue Energy Star logos on there. And usually, uh, equipment like this, like furnaces and hot water heaters, they do tend to have the energy guide on the side and usually those aren't taken off. So the energy guide is a really good way to look for information on, uh, on those sorts of things. And then finally the zones. So we typically just see that with uh, in-floor radiant heat or with mini splits. And so the, the reason that uh, zoning would be considered a green feature is that you're able to just heat an area that's being used and have a lower temperature in another place. So with mini splits, you can have them in different rooms. And so you can heat and cool that room um, instead of doing it for the whole house. And same with the uh, in-floor radiant heat. You, you know, I have it in my house and, you know, on our passive solar part of the house, we pretty much don't use it, but then we have a back area that doesn't get the sun. And so then we can uh, heat that area to a higher amount. All right, for cooling, you know, we actually give points for no air conditioning or cooling. 
Um, but we also have points if you have a more efficient, uh, you know, AC unit. And so the rating here is, an, uh, I forgot, I think, I forgot what the S stands for, but sometimes it's EER, energy efficiency rating. And so again, energy guides are often left on the side of the, the mechanical system and you can see what that rating is. And then energy star on the website, they'll say you know, what qualifies as, uh, as energy star. And so I think for a standard HVAC um, AC unit, it's 15 and above uh, for SEER rating. So in that case, this one would be, uh, would qualify for energy star, even if it didn't go through the process of getting energy star certification. And so I've got a mini split here. We're seeing a lot more of these uh, lately. This is what it looks like on the inside. Uh, and then just, we've only seen this reverse chiller uh, used once, but it is a way of using the hydronic piping in the floor that is usually for heat, uh, for cooling. And so it's also um, a heat pump, just like the mini split is. So these are super efficient ways of heating and cooling. All right, there are a lot of boxes for plumbing. So we've got two slides here. Uh, the first is a recirculation pump. And I don't know if you've seen these in homes. This one's on a timer. So the idea is that, um, you know, if you have a faucet that's quite a ways away from your hot water heater, you know, you'll have cold water in that line and you'll, you know, need to turn it on and purge the line of all that water before you actually get some hot water. And so the recirculation system will keep the hot water circulating such that when you uh, need to use it, it's right there and you don't have to waste water. But if those run all the time, that uses a lot of energy. And so having it on a timer so that it's only recirculating when you need it is a good way to save energy. Uh, here, you've probably seen the dual flush toilets. They just give you two different amounts of water per flush. Typically, it's a 0.9 or 0.8 gallons um, on the small setting and then uh, 1.6 uh, when you need more water. And so um, those are, we give points, the same amount of points for those as we do for low flush toilets, which are 1.28 gallons per flush it kind of evens out. Uh, and then solar thermal would be obvious if uh, there were somebody um, who had that on their home, you'd see it on the roof. And then usually their mechanical uh, system is pretty complicated on the inside too, um, to move that water in the way it needs to. We are starting to see a lot more heat pump water heaters, just like with the mini splits. Um, it, before it didn't make much sense to have them up here because of the cold, um, but now they're getting more efficient and, and you know the heat pump water heaters are inside as well. But you can tell they do look a little different than a standard water heater. And um, they actually pull the heat out of the air. So we had someone who installed one in his pantry and made a nice cooled pantry, um, that, which worked really well. All right, and so this is the next part of the plumbing. So WaterSense is an EPA certification program. So Energy Star is, uh, is the Department of Energy. Uh, EPA has the WaterSense program. And just like with Energy Star, there you have certain criteria for getting uh, your fixtures certified um, through them. And so um, in terms of Right, like with stickers, same with the Energy Star, like you might not find a sticker. It might, you know, someone might take that off their toilet, but you can then look in the tank of the toilet and see that uh, the flow is stamped on the inside of the tank. So 1.28 gallons per flush is a low flow fixture and uh, certifiable by water sense. And then with faucets, 
oftentimes you can find the flow on them. We search high and low a lot of times. This delta faucet, it's really easy to see right here. You know, this one's on the side. Sometimes, uh, like particularly with in the lab, you know, uh, laboratory sinks, those filters that you can uh, unscrew, those will have a stamp of how many gallons per minute flow it, it has. But then sometimes you can find it on the base of the faucet. Um, so do look around when you're trying to figure out if it's a low flow fixture uh, or not. We don't see a ton of electric on-demand uh, hot water heaters, but this is a, a Steibel Eltron German model uh, for a, a small house. Um, typically, they're gas fired because you know you need to really heat water quickly, and to that's a whole lot of energy, and so it the gas tends to work better for that than the electric. All right, next up we have indoor air quality features, and uh, the first of which is uh, radon, a radon mitigation system. And so these are important in our area. There are a lot of places in Coconino County with elevated levels of radon. And you can't tell based on your area because it can vary from lot to lot, um, you know, whether there is radon gas. So radon gas is a byproduct of uranium. And, you know, so it comes out of the soil and you kind of need the perfect storm of events in order to have it in your house. You know, it needs to be in the soil. It needs to have a, a way to move up through the soil and then get under your slab. And then there need to be cracks in the slab for it to come through. But it is pretty inexpensive to put in one of these systems, so we uh, typically recommend them. And so this picture here shows you uh, what it looks like under the slab. So in the, the fill under there, they put in a perforated pipe so that the gas can move into that pipe. And then up here you can see then it's covered in plastic and taped to the stem wall. And then there's a pipe that comes up through the center of the house and uh, the stack effect or, you know, the wind blowing across the top will draw it up through. And this one shows a little uh, place where you could hook up in a fan. So what is recommended is that you put in this passive radon ventilation system where you just have the pipe and everything under here. But then if you test and you have high radon, you have the ability to put a fan up in the attic to actually aid mechanically uh, with moving that from underneath to drop your radon level in the house. So that those are those two systems. And so uh, mechanical ventilation is getting more and more important as we try to build our houses more and more tight, you know, so uh, even with the current energy code and not people going above and beyond like uh, people tend to do in our program, houses are getting tighter. And so, you know, if you don't have the air leakage into the house, then, um, you know, things can build up like radon gas, for instance, or, you know, uh, paint off gassing, furniture off gassing, carpet off gassing of uh, VOCs. And so we look for and give points for ventilation, both uh, the mechanical kind. And then, you know, we have things like the kitchen exhaust fan. We, if it's really quiet, we give points for that. Um, but what's the, the best approach to mechanical ventilation is uh, this ERV here, energy recovery ventilator. And so you might not see this in a house if you are going in to, you know, tour it and, but you would see the controls. So that's something you would see in the wall. This is a control that allows you to adjust the amount of air that is being brought in. And we like this the most because it's the most energy efficient. It has an energy recovery core. In, and so the interior air is drawn out 
uh, you know, drawn through it and out of the house, but the heat is trapped in that energy recovery core. And so when fresh air is drawn in, it picks up that warm, that warmth from the core and brings it back into the house. So you're not losing as much heat, which also adds to comfort in the house. So you're getting nice fresh air, but it's also at a, at a good temperature. I included one more picture here of a, uh, a motion sensor because we give points for that in terms of ventilation too. So the way that would work is, you know, a lot of times people don't use the exhaust fans in their bathroom. And so if you're relying on that, you know, you don't have an energy recovery ventilator, then you're, um, you know, relying on your exhaust fans in the house to bring in fresh air. But if you're not using them, then you're not getting a turnover of air. And so with an occupancy sensor or a humi uh, humidity sensor, that will you know, automatically kick in and ensure that you're um, creating that negative pressure in the house so that you're drawing in more air from the outside. So uh, water source, there's just the one, the water catchment. And so we have had the privilege of working with a number of projects in Coconino County, um, where they were in areas where you could only, you know, the groundwater was so deep that you had to haul water. And so rather than doing that, they have decided to use rainwater for all their needs, not just for irrigation, but for their potable uh, water as well. And so in order to do that, you really need a lot of storage because you have to capitalize on the storms when they uh, do come because they don't come that often. And so you need to be able to store as much as you can from each storm. So you can see here, um, you know, it does require quite a bit. And around Flagstaff, we typically see about 10,000 gallons of storage, but uh, further out, you know, it, it can be 15,000, 20,000 gallons of rainwater storage. And then you have to treat it with uh, filtration. And then usually um, UV is used for disinfection. There has to be some kind of disinfection. Um, the code requires it. On the exterior, I don't know enough about synthetic stucco to really speak to this. Um, I'm thinking it's on here probably because it's uh, durable. And, and so maybe that's what qualifies it for sustainability. But the VOCs, you know, we talked about that in terms of indoor air quality, but it's not in terms of health, it's not a, an issue, you know, on an exterior building uh, of the building, but it does, um, it does impact air quality outside. And so there is this EcoWise certification that does look at um, the components of the paint and their actual interaction with uh, atmospheric, uh, yeah, with other chemicals and the byproducts of that. So I know there are certifications related to exterior VOCs as well. This is the fun part, the construction. This is, uh, uh, you know, what's most exciting in the sustainable building program is when people are building with alternative approaches to, to the standard stick frame. It's, uh, you know, mo the ones that we show here are fairly standard and do have codes. Uh, we have people that are, you know, trying to build with earth bags and papercrete and all kinds of other things too. Um, but these are pretty standard alternatives and also uh, more energy efficient. So the first one is uh, in, uh, the ICF, insulated concrete forms. <clears throat> and I thought this picture might be easiest to see how they work. They kind of go together like blocks and you pour concrete down in here. So the concrete is the structural part of the building and then the insulation is on the interior and the exterior of the wall. And so one of the great things about this, uh, and this is also true with this SIPS panel here, is that there's no thermal bridging. And so thermal bridging, if you look at the stick frame wall, uh, wood will conduct heat 
uh, from the inside to the outside. So you'll have heat loss through that thermal bridging of the inside and outside. Whereas with these two products, there is no way for heat to move across them at all. And so um, those are yeah great approaches. This uh, panelized system here is called the air light panel. And it's actually made in Kingman. One of the things we like about this is that it's, uh, you can see that the whole house was basically delivered on this truck and it's a lightweight material. So not very costly to ship from Kingman, but also it's uh, built to the design. So there's no construction waste on site for that. Let's see. And then insulation is also in this section. Um, spray foam is a great insulator, uh, has a high R value. R stands for resistance to heat loss. And so the higher the R value, the better the insulative uh, capability of that material. So spray foam is both high in R value, but it also is a great air sealer. I don't know if you've ever bought one of those cans of uh, spray foam to <laughs> fill in cracks in uh, a house or anything like that, but it expands to fill the space that it's sprayed into. So it is great for that reason. And then this is uh, this is sprayed in uh, cellulose, blown in, blown in cellulose, and it's made of recycled newspapers. And that comes from down in the valley, so fairly uh, regional. Um, so it is, it doesn't have that same air sealing capability as the spray foam, but it really excels in terms of embodied energy. And when we're talking about climate change, that's something that's really important is how much energy did it take to make it? And so spray foam is great in terms of operational energy. Uh, it's going to save you a lot on your bills because it's very insulative, but it takes a lot of energy to make spray foam insulation, whereas uh, the cellulose is much lower impact. And so we've had some people kind of switch over from one to the other as, as they've done more research on that. And continuing on with the construction. Um, so I had talked about passive solar when I showed you that straw bale house in the, in the beginning. This is a much more modern version of a passive solar home, lots of south glass, um, and it's got a concrete floor, which then absorbs that heat that comes in from the sun and then re-radiates at night. This, this shows you how passive solar works. So in the winter, the sun is at a low angle in the sky. And so you can see the glass in these, uh, you know, in this house, the sun's going to be able to angle through that. But then as uh, the seasons pass, it starts, you know, going higher into the sky until summer when it's up above the house. And so it's not coming in and heating up the house anymore. And so it's a really smart way to take advantage of some free heat from the sun. Part of the reason I bring that up is the trom wall, which is our last item here. here. Uh, this trom wall is at Willow Bend and you could go anytime to Willow Bend Environmental Education Center uh, near the county jail. Um, and you can walk around, see the gardens, but it's a passive solar building with a trom wall. And so a trom wall, you know, this is just the south window where the sun can go in. This has, it's a mass wall. So it, a lot of times they're built with block, sometimes it's with earth and then painted black to absorb the sun. And then they put a glass in front of it because it's sort of like working with a passive solar the high energy light rays can go through the glass, but then once it's absorbed and re-radiated, the lower um, energy heat waves can't get out of the glass as easily as the light comes through. So you, you build up some energy, um, some heat that way. And then it radiates to the inside of the building at night. And this is a rammed earth wall. We don't have any examples of like a full rammed earth house, but um, this Mars Hill house does have a rammed earth wall. 
just for the purpose of mass and for absorbing heat during the day and keeping the home warm at night. Okay, got everything there. Oh, and then straw bale. So straw bale, like I said, you know, waste material, people like it for that. It's also super insulative. So I had talked about the R value, you know, standard code is an R20. Our, uh, the R value of a straw bale house is like an R50, depending on what way the straw bale is oriented. So really insulative. And then a lot of people like it because, uh, you know, you can have like a wall raising party and have people come and lift bales with you. And it's kind of a DIY approach to building. So this is Veronica Gox. She actually built this house herself. All right, windows, not all windows are created equal. And with this, you're not looking for R value, you're looking at the U factor, which is the inverse of the R value. And so you, the lower the U factor, the more insulative the window. And so uh, currently the code is that in, uh, I think both, yes, city and county have adopted the same energy code, it's 0.3. It has to be at least 0.3 or lower. Um, and so older windows are not going to probably have that same U value. And so, um, and it's going to be hard for you to determine what that is unless there's a sticker on here that shows that it's Energy Star or your client has kept that information for you. We actually have not yet seen any solar shingles. So Marty put in this uh, you know, image of one, um, but we look forward to seeing that. It's just a integrated solar panel and roofing system. So you know, I'm right now we have a solar co-op. I don't know if you heard about it. Um, it's actually the first group it's closed, but it is, um, it's a co-op where people can join and then through the power of bulk purchasing, get about a 15% reduction in the cost of their solar PV system. So um, yeah, with us, we, you know, we have a roof that's been in place for a while, you know, and sort of assessing, do we need to replace the roof before we put the solar panels on it? Um, you know, if you have something like this, it's all combined and you, you don't have that issue. All right, and so this is just a box of all green features, energy and green features. And so lighting, I mean, pretty much right now, LED is the way to go. We don't see when we certify new projects, you know, it's pretty much all LED and it's easy to swap out bulbs. So, you know, that would be essentially what I would think you would be, you know, it would be LED lighting you would give a green credit for. And then an energy audit. I put up Cozy Home here. Cozy Home is the only company uh, that we know of locally that does energy audits, but that is their business. Um, they work APS, partly funds an energy audit. So you can get a, an energy audit for $99 through Cozy Home. And they will do what I show here is a blower door test uh, where they essentially uh, close so they have a, something that fits into the door that then, you know, you can see the duct and the blower and it basically creates a vacuum on your house. It draws air through that to the outside and then it can measure how much air it's able to pull at a particular uh, vacuum. And so, you know, based on that and also, you know, then they can see where that's coming from and can address leaks in your home and inadequate insulation uh, and things like that. So not only $99 to get that done and get your green check. <laughs> and then solar tubes. Uh, this is a church that had about 16 of them to bring in natural light. Uh, so it's a, a way of daylighting that's more energy efficient uh, for, you know, an interior space that doesn't have windows uh, than a skylight is. Though I have seen Energy Star skylights as well, but solar tubes are recognized as being more energy efficient. 
and solar panels uh, that that actually has a separate box later in the in the input form we talked about uh, fresh air you know getting uh, mechanical systems for ventilating the house and then finally uh, gray water systems so gray water is a great way to save uh, potable water by water irrigating your plants with wastewater but it's not wastewater <laughs> uh, from the toilet or the kitchen sink. Gray water is just uh, water effluent from the uh, washing machine, shower, and laboratory sinks. And this, I just wanted to point out, so part, this is a just a simple gray water system where it's collecting the gray water from the second story into this little tank. You don't want a big tank for gray water because uh, you shouldn't leave it sit for more than a, a day um, because it can go septic because it has a lot of or it has organic matter in it. And so you can get that same stinky smell as a septic. And so you want to you know, turn it over pretty quickly. But this valve here shows uh, a requirement of the code. And so gray water, you don't typically use year round, you know, you're not watering plants usually in the winter. And part of the code is that you have to be able to divert it to the sewer in times when you're not using it. So this is a valve that allows him to divert it to his gray water system or to the sewer. And so I don't know that you'd be able to, you know, he has an access panel. So that might be a clue uh, about a gray water system because sometimes people will plumb for gray water and then, you know, for future use. And so that would be handy to have information about. All right, this is about third party certifications. So just like the sustainable building program, we have our uh, certification program. There are a whole lot of other uh, organizations that have put together checklists and have their own certification programs. So we'll go through each of these. And this is, you know, they would potentially have more information um, we are in the process, we would like to be able to share all the information that we have about the projects that have gone through our program and to make it easy for realtors and appraiser, appraisers to access that information. And so um, through our permitting system at the county, we um, are basically taking the project putting in the information into the permitting system. And then we plan on working with our GIS department to create an app. Um, you know, I don't know, if probably most of you have been on our website and gone to the mapping feature, the parcel viewer, which allows you to get a lot of information about different parcels. But um, we want to have that same ability with sustainable features of projects that have gone through our program. And we also plan on uh, working with E3 Energy to get their information because they are the third party rater for all the different certifications that um, we've seen in the county. So I'll be going through uh, the ones that we have seen and that E3 Energy does. So we hope to, um, yeah, get that up and running in the next couple of years, I'd say. All right, so um, the first two uh, certifications, third party certifications that you might see, and both of these projects here have them. Again, this is Ezra Builders. He will uh, you know, pay for that third party certification for the EPA Indoor Air Plus and Energy Star. Those are both EPA um, programs. So the Air Plus, it's a separate checklist. It's all about indoor air quality, whereas Energy Star is about energy efficiency. So EPA has Energy Star, but Department of Energy developed uh, high performance with Energy Star, which is also in the NAR form, input form. Um, it's actually I have not seen any home certified as home performance with Energy Star, 
it's for existing buildings, whereas everything you know we've seen is Energy Star. So I'm not sure if uh, E3 Energy does certify, um, you know, does that certification, but I would think so since they do Energy Star. And then zero energy ready homes are a step up from Energy Star. They are uh, require more efficiency of the building envelope and uh, mechanical systems, and also a higher uh, focus on indoor air quality. Uh, it's called zero energy ready homes. You know, it's not net zero, it's zero energy ready. And so it does have solar ready, which means it has all the conduit and um, the roof is sized for having solar PV added, but it doesn't have solar PV yet. And so it's a whole checklist too that uh, is like uh, Energy Star, but it's a higher bar. And again, E3 Energy is our local rater for that. Lead for homes, we've only seen two uh, lead uh, homes. We've seen more commercial uh, projects to the LEED certification. And it, its checklist is uh, was created and maintained and updated regularly by the US Green Building Council. So it's a pretty expensive uh, process. And so you know, I think it's probably $5,000 or something like that to get that certification. So it's not often that people are willing to do that just for the, the kudos or, you know, to be able to list it on the NAR input form. <laughs> but again, E3 Energy would be who does that certification. All right, uh, the National Green Building Standard, I haven't seen any uh, projects certified for any three, either of these three programs. And I did go online and look, um, it's not a program that E3 Energy does a certification of. It looked like the uh, most local uh, rater would be from Utah for this one. So um, yeah, probably not gonna see a lot of that. So the HERS index is a really, cool thing and I wish more people <laughs> would do it because so it stands for home energy rating system and it is sort of like oops sorry about that it's sort of like uh you know when you buy a car there's the sticker on the car that sh shows you the miles per gallon you know sort of the energy efficiency of that car the HERS index is intended to be like that so that you could have a rating like it's, you know, shows you how energy efficient it is. And then you can compare that to other homes if they had HERS ratings. So it's a great idea. You know, if it were applied more, you'd be able to compare homes, uh, you know, much more easily. And so I put in here, these are the the aspects that are looked at in terms of the HERS rating. So it is about the envelope, um, you know, windows, doors, vents, the wall insulation, you know, ceiling and roof as well, but also about mechanical systems. And so, you know, just to give you an idea how much energy you're going to use, um, you know, in the operation of the home. And so the way it works is that a baseline home, which is one that was built to the 2006 energy code, is considered, uses 100% of the energy. Whereas if you rated at 65, that would mean that home uses 65% of the energy that the baseline home would. So it gives you a way to compare homes and then hopefully, yeah, you can decide to choose an energy efficient one. Solar panels, uh, you know, whether they're owned or leased, whether they're on grid, we see both, you know, with the off grid, you've got all the other equipment for storing the energy when, um, you know, it's not being produced by the panels because it's night. Um, and then, you know, here's an example of one that is connected to the grid and it, you know, they're buying and selling power uh, to APS. 
And then it's got a place for you to say how big that system is, how many kilowatts. And so that com that's completes the uh, NAR form. I just wanted to put in a quick plug for the green designation that Tad was talking about or eco broker. So this is just a little information I'm sharing today, you know, in an hour. Um, but if you want to dig a bit deeper and learn more, you can um, get a certification, either NAR Green or Eco Broker. And Tad had a great point. I'm glad he uh, put in a plug for our tour. Our tour is always part of the Festival of Science. It's the second weekend of the Festival of Science. And so it's usually at the end of September or early October. And we're starting to plan for it. Our this year's tour. So we will be having a tour this year. I don't know in terms of the pandemic if we'll have to have any extra precautions or anything, but um, we do plan on it. So we hope you'll come out and learn a bit more. And then finally, because we want to incentivize, uh, you know, people learning more about sustainable buildings so that um, it becomes more uh, clear in the industry and we can hopefully increase the valuation of sustainable buildings, uh, the county wants to incentivize it. And so if you do get your green designation or eco broker, uh, then we will highlight you. So we have, you know, a newsletter and a Facebook page and we have events. And so Tad was in our newsletter and, and on our website. And yeah, so we uh, would love to highlight that if you uh, choose to get that certification. And with that, I uh, would be happy to open it up to questions. And I will stop sharing my screen. <laughs> that was so informative, Nina. Thank you so much going uh, over not only the data sheet, but um, those different specifications in which they fill um, a, a wealth of knowledge. Thank you so much. Uh, I don't see any questions here in the Q&A box, uh, so now's a good time. Uh, we've got about 12 minutes left, so if you've got questions, this is your opportunity for, for Ms. Nina here. Go ahead and unmute yourself and ask away. Look at that. You and Tad did such a great job. It apparently uh, uh, was so full of information that we don't have any questions just yet. So uh, Tad, was there anything that you maybe wanted to add on and piggyback on that? It was a great PowerPoint that you provided as well. Thank you. Uh, no, just to reaffirm a bit what Nina said, um, the green designation is a good place to start for sure. Um, and again, this is just an ongoing, like I don't think any of us expect everybody to absorb everything that was just presented and be an expert right away. But if you just keep exposing yourself to this stuff, um, you know, when you're sitting down and taking a listing, it'll, it'll help. And again, I, I get asked, I don't know about you guys, but um, it's a pretty prominent thing these days for people to ask what are the energy costs or what type of windows does it have or um, things like that. And it's just going to be an ongoing, you know, I've even had buyers that were climate migrants, you know, that said we're moving to Flagstaff because we think it's going to be the best place as the, the planet sort of heats up. Um, so I think we're going to be seeing more and more of that. So just to, from a sort of selfish perspective as being a, an agent that can market yourself as knowledgeable in that, I think it's really worthwhile. Yeah, I just want to uh, also point out that if you want to learn more, feel free to check out our website too. So it's uh, coconino.az.gov slash sustainable building. And we actually have on there, um, PowerPoints of all the different projects that have been um, awarded over the years. Right now, we have a virtual tour, which was it was kind of cool to make because, you know, it it was just different than the regular tour in that I have all these images from the construction of the home, and so I was able to sort of show, you know, the insulation and everything else that you can't see when you go to a regular tour. So that's up on our website from last year. I think we had 18 projects or something like that. So if you wanted to check out a virtual tour, um, yeah, go to our website. 
That sounds cool. You know, I had a couple of questions. Uh, one, um, for people that are considering like a water filtration system, I didn't see any category in which that is. And that's the concern we've got about putting one in our house uh, ourselves, but you've got to um, flush it ever so often. So automatically you're wasting so much water. Is there an alternative to that? Yes, we have actually seen some that aren't uh, the flushing kind. So um, yeah, if you want to shoot me an email, I can send you some information on ones that we've seen. That's sort of our lens that I always have. It's just like on these projects, I learn about all these different technologies and things that people have implemented. So uh, I'd be happy to share that. Sweet. Fantastic. And then another question, uh, rammed earth, I know you talked about it, but what exactly is that? I, I couldn't quite tell from the photo if that was a, a stone or uh, could you be a little more specific? I'm just curious in, in general. Yeah, it actually is. a. It becomes a lot like stone, but it is just earth. And so we, but it's rammed into forms. So you build these forms and then you put in, you know, you have to have a certain a mix of different kinds of soil, the sand clay uh, mix in particular, silt isn't something that's desirable, but you put it into the form and then uh, use a pneumatic uh, compactor to, and it has to, you have to compress it a certain amount. But I don't know if you saw, it's that he did it with different kind of coloring throughout the wall. So it was just really beautiful. Um, but we do have a code now, which is really exciting because there wasn't a code which made it really hard to permit. But now, um, just this past year, we passed an ordinance that adopted New Mexico's earthen code so that people now have a code for Adobe and rammed earth in Coconino County. So um, yeah, it's a, I hope to see more of it. It's very labor intensive, which I think is why we're not <laughs> seeing a lot of it. I'm assuming using soil that's got a lot of iron in it to be able to conduct uh, the heat through uh, to, to pass through. No, it doesn't. Yeah, it's not important for that. It's more the, the binding ability of it. So it's the clay and sand. That's what's important. And then in terms of the heat, that was one of the things we had a hard time with the code. You need to be able to insulate it and having the insulation on the outside is uh, what's best um, for energy efficiency, but okay. that's a whole another story. <laughs> but you can build an entire house out of a stone uh, as long as you've got the insulating factor with it, I assume, mm -hmm. which would be pretty cool looking. It's similar to an Adobe in, in, in its um, design, right? Right, yes. Very cool. All right. So I lived in a, a over a hundred year old adobe house in um, Santa Fe, and we it would it would the, whole, the insulating factor of that house was just incredible. It was like eighteen inch walls it was really cool. Mm. Yeah. yeah, certain climates are better for it than others. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. That was great presentation. Very informative, like I said, wealth of information. Um, and Nina, um, thank you so much for your information that you provided. If you didn't catch it, maybe you could put it back up on the screen. Just one last shot. In fact, it may actually be in our box here. Nope. Um, contact information. If not, you can reach out to Tab or myself and we can forward you that information if you missed it. Um, again, thanks so much for being here. And uh, as part of our Lunch and Learn series, just about every Tuesday. However, this is the last one for May. So go and have a vacation on your next two couple of Tuesdays and join us. Come back in June. We've got every Tuesday filled up with more Lunch and Learn topics for you uh, coming at you to help uh, you guys be better informed and uh, educated realtors. If you have any questions, if you have any suggestions on what you'd like to see us offer for Lunch and Learn uh, education series, please feel free to reach out to me, Melinda Morvan, uh, and we'll get some things rolling for you. Again, thanks everybody for being here. And uh, if there's no other questions or comments, we'll go ahead and let you guys move on with the rest of your day.